and uh, we'll get the show on the road here. I want to welcome everyone to the 1158th regular meeting and public hearing of the Livonia City Planning Commission. I wish to inform all interested persons in the audience that for petitions on tonight's agenda, which involve a question of zoning, the Planning Commission will make a recommendation to the City Council and the City Council after holding their own public hearing <laughs> will make the final determination as to whether a petition is approved or denied. The Planning Commission holds the only public hearing on requests for preliminary plats and or vacating petitions. The Commission's recommendation is forwarded to the City Council for the final determination as to whether the petition is accepted or rejected. If a petition is requesting a waiver of use or a site plan and is denied tonight, the petitioner will have 10 days in which to appeal the decision in writing to City Council. Resolutions adopted by a City Planning Commission will become effective seven days after the date of adoption. The Planning Commission and professional staff have reviewed each of these petitions upon their filing. The staff has furnished the Commission with both approving and denying resolutions, which the Commission may or may not use, depending on the outcome of the proceedings tonight. Uh, if our Secretary is ready, please call the roll. Mrs. Smiley. Present. Mrs. McHugh. Present. Mr. Bongero? Here. Mr. Long? Here. Mr. Chair? Present. Uh, Chair Magno is here. Chairman Wilshaw? Is here. Uh, thank you. We have all members present along with uh, Mark Tormina. We have Deb Walter uh, and a number of other folks from our, uh, Stephanie Reese from our um, planning staff tonight. And uh, I just want to mention that the format of how this meeting will work, uh, similar to all our meetings that we've had recently through Zoom, is uh, we will start by calling uh, each item on our agenda. And we'll go to Mr. Toramina for background information on the item. And then uh, we'll ask if the petitioner is with us in the audience to please use the raise hand feature of Zoom to let us know that you're in the audience uh, as Mr. Toramina is giving his remarks. We will then uh, allow you to speak and participate in the meeting. You can give us additional information about your petition. And uh, then anyone else in the audience who wishes to speak for or against any of these agenda items will also be given an opportunity to raise their hand and speak uh, after the petitioner. Uh, so that's the general format of how these meetings go. And uh, with that, uh, I believe we can start with the first item on our public hearing section of our agenda. Mr. Uh, Secretary? This is petition 2020-07-01-03 submitted by the Leo Sobe Building Company, Inc. pursuant to section 23.01 of the City of Livonia Zoning Ordinance number 543 as amended, requesting to rezone the property 37855 Linden Avenue, formerly the Webster Elementary School site, located on the south side of Linden between Newburgh and Hicks Roads in the southeast quarter of section 19 from public lands to R1 and one family residential. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Mr. Tormina. I believe you're muted, Mark. Apologize for that. Uh, this is a request to rezone the former Webster Elementary School <laughs> property from PL public land to R1, one family residential. Uh, this is a 9.3 acre site. It's on the south side of Linden. It's north of uh, Mason, uh, as well as uh, between Nola and Blue Skies. And the zoning map uh, that you should see on your screen shows the location of the property in relationship to the, uh, the surrounding area. The uh, proposed rezoning and the subsequent residential development uh, that would involve the site, uh, it would involve the entire property, that is, uh, which is currently owned by Livonia Public Schools. LPS is in the process of selling the land to your petitioner. Um, you can, you'll notice that there are existing single family lots that border the property to the east and west with addresses on Blue Skies and NOLA, respectively. Uh, the site is surrounded by R1 zoning and all of the lots in the area measure 60 feet by 120 feet as well as 7,200 square feet, uh, which is the minimum required for R1 zoning. Uh, the conceptual plan uh, was presented with the application. This plan shows a total of 31 lots. As you can see here, 
Uh, the design includes a cul-de-sac street extending north from Mason and providing access to lots one through 21. Lots 22 and 23 are in the southwest corner of the property and those would have direct access from Mason Avenue. Uh, these lots are adjacent to a, a small uh, open space park. And then at the north end, you'll see lots 24 through 31 all have frontage directly on Linden Avenue. Uh, some other features of the plan include the stormwater detention basin along the west side of the site, as well as a second larger open space area located in the northwest uh, corner. Uh, the street would have a right of way width of 60 feet and uh, the cul-de-sac would be 120 feet in diameter. As far as future land use map, it does show it as parks and community and that reflects the current ownership as well as the former use of the uh, site um, as a school. Uh, this petition is actually one of three involving former school properties. Uh, the other two are Adams, which are located on the south side of Linden between Harrison and Inkster, and Wilson located on the northwest corner of Harrison and West Chicago. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I will read out the correspondence. Uh, yes, please. So the first item is dated August 10th and it reads as follows from our engineering division. In accordance with your request, the engineering division has reviewed the above reference petition. We have no objections to the proposed rezoning at the time. The parcel is assigned the address of 37855 Linden Avenue. The legal description submitted by the owner appears to be correct, but we would like to suggest using following simplified legal description instead. The proposed development is currently serviced by public water main sanitary and storm sewers, which will need to be extended to service any new residences. The submitted drawing does not indicate any utility connections, so we do not have any knowledge of impacts to the existing systems at this time. The owner has been in contact with this office regarding the project and is aware of the engineering department's requirements. It should be noted that should the project move forward, the proposed construction will be required to meet the Wayne County stormwater ordinance, including detention requirements. A full review of the proposed development will be completed when plans are submitted for permitting. And that letter is signed by David Lear, assistant city engineer. Next is a letter dated August 10th coming from the Department of Finance indicating that there are no objections to the proposal uh, as there are no outstanding amounts receivable, general or water and sewer. And that letter is signed by Connie Kumpula, chief accountant. And lastly, a letter from the treasurer uh, dated August 7th, also indicating no objection as no taxes are due. Uh, that letter is signed by Linda Shield, treasurer of the city of Livonia. And that is the extent of the correspondence. Thank you, Mr. Toramina. Do we have any questions from the Planning Commission of our planning staff? Uh, Mr. Chairman? Uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Toramina, did I understand you to say that this is part of a three parcel sale to this developer? Not to this developer, Mr. Uh, uh, Ventura. Um, there, uh, there are two buyers of the three sites. I believe this petitioner or um, close affiliate uh, is involved in the, one of the other uh, two sites, the Wilson site, but there's a, a second developer uh, with an interest currently in purchasing the Wilson's or the uh, Adam site. So we can anticipate seeing those before too long. Uh, the one plan has been uh, submitted and that's something you'll see in the next couple of weeks. That's correct for Adams. Thank you, Mr. Tormina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Ventura. Any other questions for our planning staff? I don't see any other questions for Mr. Toramina. Uh, our petitioner, I believe, is in the audience. Uh, there we are, Mr. Sove. Let me click the right button. There you go. And you can unmute yourself and introduce yourself, name and address uh, for the record. Good evening, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? We hear you. Oh, very good. Enrico Suave on behalf of the petitioner tonight. Uh, 37771 Seven Mile Road, uh, Livonia, 48152. Uh, nothing uh, additional with uh, Mark's presentation other just to reiterate that we are asking for R1 single family. Um, I believe we're surrounded by R1 single family. And I do believe also the master plan indicates uh, R1 as well. Um, other than that, I would uh, happy to answer any questions for the commission tonight. Thank you, Mr. Suave, for being here. And 
uh, for your introduction. Again, I just want to remind uh, both <coughs> the commission and the folks in the audience that this is a rezoning request. So our focus tonight is to look at the zoning and the, if it's the proper fit for this area. And uh, we will not have a lot of discussion in regards to a site plan. That's a step that would come later uh, once the zoning has been uh, moved along the council. So uh, well, we see a conceptual site plan, this is not necessarily gonna be the final product. Uh, Correct. Any questions for our petitioner from the commission? All right. I don't see any questions from any of the commissioners at this time. Is there anyone in the audience uh, who wishes to speak for or against this item? Please use the raise hand uh, feature. We do have a few folks that are connected by phone. If you're connected by phone, you need to dial star nine to uh, raise your hand by telephone. We do have a couple folks with their hands up. Uh, so we're gonna go to them and give them an opportunity to speak for or against. We're gonna start with uh, Victoria. And we just ask that you unmute yourself. And again, uh, normally we ask that you provide your name and address uh, just so we know who we're speaking. Good evening. Hello, Victoria. We're not hearing anything from Victoria. So what we're gonna do is we're going to uh, move on to the next person and uh, we'll give, we'll circle back and see if uh, Victoria's got their, her audio issue sorted out. Uh, the next person is uh, Joe Rowe. And we'll give you an opportunity to unmute yourself and uh, introduce yourself. Well, Hello, Joe. I wondered um, what type of home you're thinking of building on this location in the price range of them. Uh, Joe, your, your audio is very, very low, so it's hard to hear you. Can you ask your question one more time? Yes, I just wondered what type of homes will be built and what price range I, okay, the type of homes and the price range. I, I hear that question. Uh, we will ask the petitioner that question and to see what their intention is. They give you uh, an answer on that. Uh, Thank you. Is, is, do you have any other questions or comments that you'd like to include? Um, and the builder, it will just be one builder in this one here by Webster School, correct? Yes, that's the intention. All right. And has he built other homes in our area? Uh, Mr. Sove, uh, his company has built homes throughout the city. Uh, when we give him an opportunity to speak again, he can maybe give a little bit more information about his background as a builder, but he is uh, well known in the city for uh, uh, building, uh, especially with these, uh, I guess what we would call infill type uh, properties, smaller properties that uh, are uh, uh, being filled in like this with uh, you know a dozen, two dozen homes. Uh, he's also done some larger subdivisions as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you for coming tonight and we'll get those questions answered for you. Thank you. And we have one more person uh, asking to speak here. So let me uh, give them an opportunity to speak. This is a telephone. A uh, person who's called in, you can dial star six, I believe it is, to unmute, and the phone number ends in 5387. Good evening. Hi, this is Victoria. <laughs> I oh, called hi. in. <laughs> oh. Hi, you can hear me now. Okay, um, so um, do I need to give you my address also? Uh, if you would like to, please. Oh, okay. Um, 14436 NOLA. Okay. I live right, I live right behind the old Webster property. Okay. Um, so if I could just say a couple of words, sure. um, I'm going to start off by saying I'm opposed to building houses on this property. Um, I've lived in uh, Livonia my whole life. 
Um, I did go to the old Webster school. <laughs> um, but when they decided to um, tear down the Webster school, they regraded it to be a green space. And over the last 12 years, it has evolved into a most beautiful green space for our neighborhood. Um, the property um, at that point has been used, as you know, for um, Livonia school soccer tournaments and radio field day last year, um, which garnered about 150 visitors, their best year yet, with people coming from all over. Um, people use this field every day. They use it to walk their dogs, bring family to sit under the trees. People come from all over the city to walk their dogs in this field in our beautiful green space. Um, the property, um, this, the, if I can back up for one minute, um, the green space has sold many homes in the sub. I've spoken to quite a few people who have told me that this is one of the reasons why that they bought in Castle Gardens. Um, it's in a natural environmental asset and it's a home to wildlife. You know, it's a natural resource for water retention. Um, you know, I just, I'm just stating a, a few things um, that are that are my views, and reasons not to privatize the property would put us through, you know, three years plus of construction with trucks coming up Linden and Mason. Those are our main thoroughfares, and and tying up our roads coming into our homes, um, you know, and creating construction dust into our homes for for that period of time, um, you know. Um, the green space really serves as a core to the neighborhood and preserving it would be a real asset to the neighborhood. No offense to the builder, I'm sure that, you know, he thinks it will be okay, um, but this has a special place and it has a special place in our hearts. And I really encourage each and every one of you to come visit the property early in the morning when the sun is rising, because that's when it's most beautiful. And you can hear rare birds and squirrels. And during this pandemic, especially, it's been an important place to relax and enjoy mother nature. Excellent, well, thank you for your comments, Victoria. I appreciate the fact that you were able to call in and make those comments. And uh, uh, just so you know that uh, uh, the decision to sell this property and rezone it from public land uh, to any sort of private zoning, residential or otherwise, uh, was ultimately the decision of the of the school board to decide to sell that I property. Yeah, I understand that. But uh, yeah, I understand. Yeah. Okay, good, good. I I just wanted to make sure that you were aware of that. Uh, oh no, I yeah, I'm I was I was aware of that. Okay, great, great. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you for your comments. We will take those into uh, account, and we will. Uh, be talking again to the uh, petitioner uh, after each of our audience members has a chance to speak so he can respond to some of those comments. Uh, okay, so thank, thank you, you so coming. much. I appreciate the time to speak. All right, uh, hang around and we'll, uh, you can see how this uh, uh, concludes. So thank you. I'm just gonna put you back on mute and go to the next person. Thank you for okay, coming. Thank you. And is there anyone else wishing to speak uh, for or against this item? I don't see anyone else new. Uh, Joe has asked to speak one more time, so I'm gonna give her another chance. Let me just unmute her one moment. There we go. She can unmute herself now. No, I'm sorry, I did not, I had lowered my hand. I didn't raise it, but oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, you're all set? All right, great. Thank you. Uh, with that, I think uh, everyone else has had a chance to speak in our audience. Is there, if there's no one else wishing to speak, I'm going to uh, go back to Mr. Suave. Yes. There, you're back. And uh, you did hear uh, some questions asked of our audience, specifically in regards to the type of home that you're planning to put there and uh, pricing. If you could uh, uh, enlighten us on those things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as the commission is probably well aware, uh, we're second generation uh, builders and developers. Um, I couldn't put a number on how many homes either uh, one of our family members built throughout Livonia in the past 30 years. But this subdivision, we're expecting for pricing to start around 300,000 mark and will mirror the same type of product we put 
um, a mile and a half north on Heritage Square development, which is on Newburgh, just uh, it's on Newburgh, uh, south of Six Mile. That was uh, a 50 lot subdivision, which should be completed uh, by the end of the calendar year 2020. So it'll be the same, similar type of product. Pricing uh, will be similar as well. So if any of the audience or the public want to see what type of product we're anticipating, it'll be very, very close to what we did in the past two years at Heritage Square um, communities. And Mr. Suave, uh, in speaking of Heritage Square, as that's a comparable property. Uh, can you uh, give us some idea of how long it's taken you to sell those properties and how they've done uh, given the current economy? I, um, I think this November, will be the two year anniversary mark where the infrastructure and the roadways um, were installed. So two years to uh, implement the development and build close to 50 uh, single family homes, I think is quite remarkable. So we're hoping for the same type of turnaround given the current economic conditions and that this proposed development uh, at Webster is approximately only 31 units as opposed to 50. So we're anticipating less than a two year turnaround time from development to the uh, uh, completion of all 31 uh, single family homes. Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, any questions for our petitioner from the commission? I see no questions from the commission. Is there any other uh, comments, Mr. Uh, Suave, that you'd like to make before we make our decision? No, uh, I appreciate your time tonight and I will still be around uh, for the remainder of the evening in case something else should come up in regards to this petition. Okay, great, thank you very much. Uh, with that, we will then close out the public hearing and a motion is in order. Uh, Mr. Chair? This is Smiley. Uh, yes, before, um, did, has the uh, city of Livonia expressed any interest in buying this property and turning it into a park? That's to Mr. Tormina. Okay. Could you repeat the question? Yes. Has the city expressed any interest in purchasing this piece of property and turning it into a public park that they would have and maintain? No, no, we can't. I mean, that was my understanding. The city is not interested in buying any more property or parks at this time. Is that right? I can't answer the question, you know, whether there's interest anywhere in the city, but, but uh, there's been none expressed by the parks director or, uh, or the uh, administration um, or council that I'm aware of for this particular property. Okay. Thank you. Okay, with that in mind, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to make an approving resolution. Uh, yeah. that the request to rezone the property at 37855 Linden Avenue, former Webster Elementary School site, from PL to R1 is hereby approved, subject to council approval uh, for the following reasons. That the proposed change of zoning is compatible to and in harmony with the surrounding residential uses and zoning districts in the area. That the proposed change of zoning will provide for a single family residential development similar to density, in density to what exists in the neighboring area. That the proposed change of zoning is consistent with the existing character of the area. That the proposed zoning change does not obstruct the goals, policies, and objectives of the future land use plan. And that the proposed change of zoning of the subject property represents a reasonable and logical zoning transformation, which adheres to the principles of sound land use planning. Thank you, Mrs. Smiley. Is there support for that motion? Support. All right, we have a motion on the floor to uh, zone the property to R1 by Mrs. Smiley, supported by Mrs. McHugh. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, if the secretary is ready, please call the roll. Mrs. Smiley. Aye. Mrs. McHugh? Aye. Mr. Bajero? I believe he's muted. 
Okay. David? Aye. Sorry. Mr. Long? Aye. Mr. Ventura? Aye. <clears throat> Chair Magna votes aye. Chair Wolchoff? Votes aye. The motion passes. Uh, and this will go on to the City Council with an approving recommendation. For those in our audience uh, interested in this item, please continue to keep an eye on this as it goes to City Council. We only give a recommendation to the Council. They ultimately will make the decision on this zoning. Uh, if they choose to move forward with it, uh, there will also, um, uh, there will be a site plan that will be coming before us as well with the details of the, uh, the homes and the layout of the property. So if you're interested to continue to watch this as it comes back so you can continue to uh, uh, be involved and comment on it. So thank you very much for coming tonight. Uh, thank you, Mr. Suave, for uh, being here for this item. And we'll continue on to item number two on our agenda. Which is petition 2020-07-03-03, submitted by Stonefield Engineering and Design on behalf of Haggerty Square LLC and Haggerty Residential LLC, pursuant to section 12.08 of the Livonia Code of Ordinances of the City of Livonia as amended, to determine whether or not to vacate a section of the existing public utility easement in 19,700 and 19,750 Haggerty Road, located on the east side of Haggerty Road between seven and eight mile roads in the southwest quarter of section six. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Mr. Taramina, this is sort of a housekeeping item for a small piece of land. If you would like to give us the background on that. Yes, quickly. So this uh, involves a vacating uh, petition at Haggerty Square, which as uh, everyone knows is a mixed use development uh, located on Haggerty Road between seven and eight mile roads. And uh, this project um, includes a combination of both commercial uh, retail as well as multifamily. Uh, the retail portion is, is completed. Uh, the apartment phase is currently under construction. And uh, this utility easement, uh, which is 43 feet wide, runs along the north property line it's located on a strip of property that uh, previously contained Phillips Road. That road was vacated in 1985, but there was a full width easement uh, retained within the former right of way in order to accommodate utilities. <clears throat> Currently, the only utility that occupies a portion of that easement is DTE. They have an overline, uh, overhead line that is in the north 20 feet of the uh, easement. Overall, as indicated, it's 43 feet wide. So the petitioner would like to vacate 23 feet, uh, the south southerly 23 feet of the easement, uh, and that would allow DTE to maintain its facilities in the north 20 feet uh, and allow the petitioner to construct garages as part of the uh, overall approved uh, development. Um, the engineering division has no objections to this request. Uh, we are required to uh, hold a public hearing by, uh, by the code of ordinances and with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll read out uh, the two items of or three items of correspondence that we have on this issue. Yes, please. First is a letter from our engineering division. June 26th is the date, and it reads, pursuant to the May 27th, 2020 request from Stonefield Engineering and Design on behalf of the owners, Haggerty Square LLC and Haggerty Residential LLC, the law department has approved the request as to form and the engineering division has reviewed the utilities located on the property in question and found that the request for the partial vacation of the public utility easement is warranted. In order to proceed, the engineering division respectfully, respectfully requests that the city council do all things necessary for the vacation of the south 23 feet of the following public utility easement. That letter is signed by uh, Todd Zalinsic and Don Rohraff uh, of the city. Next, we have a letter of no objection coming from the Department of Finance dated August 10th and signed by Connie Kumpula, Chief Accountant, and a similar letter of no objection from the Office of Treasurer dated July 21st and signed by Linda Shield, Treasurer of the City. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Taramina. Uh, we don't have a, do we have a petitioner here with us tonight on this? I think we might. Let me... Uh... Give Mr. Williams a chance to speak here. Good evening, Mr. Williams. You can unmute yourself and introduce yourself. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Eric Williams. I work for Stonefield Engineering and Design. My address is 607 Shelby Street, Detroit, Michigan. Um, I think Mark, you know, explained it perfectly. Um, it is just a minor housekeeping item that that um, unfortunately we were held up. 
trying to get this worked out with DTE and they have since, you know, granted their approval. Um, so we come back to you guys for the final, you know, the final step here. So happy to answer any questions and I, I do appreciate your time. Well, thank you for being here, Mr. Williams. Uh, do we have any questions of the petitioner or the planning staff on this item? I don't see any questions from anybody for this item. Is there anyone in the audience wishing to speak for or against this item? If you can, if you do, please use the raise hand feature. I don't see anybody raising their hand. This is a fairly non-controversial item, I would say. Uh, if there is no discussion, no questions, a, uh, I can close the public hearing and a motion would be in order. Mr. Chair. Uh, Mrs. McHugh. I'd like to offer an approving resolution that the request to vacate a section of the existing public utility easement at 19700 and 19750 Haggerty Road is hereby approved for the following reasons. That this part of the easement is no longer needed for public utility purposes, that the easement area being vacated will allow the developer of Haggerty Square to complete the project as approved, including the construction of garages, which the easement currently interferes with, and no reporting city department or public utility has objected to the proposed vacating. Thank you. Is there support? Support. All right, we have a motion to approve by Mrs. McHugh, supported by Mr. Bongero. Is there any discussion on the motion? <clears throat> if not, if the secretary is ready, please call the roll on the motion to approve. Uh, Mrs. McHugh. Aye. Mr. Was it Bongero? Aye. Uh, Mrs. Smiley. Saw an aye, but her, she's muted. <laughs> okay, Mr. Long. Aye. <laughs> My husband's tried to do that for years. Mute me. Mr. Long? Aye. And Mr. Ventura? Aye. Chair Magna votes aye. Chair Wilshaw? Votes aye, and the motion's passed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Williams, for coming tonight. Then we'll go on to City Council and approving recommendation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, and have a good evening. Uh, next on our agenda, we have, let's see, item number three, Mr. Secretary. That is petition 2020-07-06-01 submitted by the Planning Commission, City Planning Commission. Pursuant to Council Resolution 170-20, in connection with the proposed amendments to sections 2.10 of Article 2 and 4.12 of Article 4, 5.15 of Article 5, and 16.02 of Article 16, Refine caregiver grow facility and regulate the zoning districts where medical marijuana facilities can operate. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Mr. Tormina, would you like to give us some information about this particular petition? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, the reference text amendments would establish regulations for medical marijuana caregiver grow operations. Currently, no local ordinances are in place to govern where these facilities can operate. Livonia, like most communities, relies solely on state law and more specifically the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act or the MMMA of 2008. As a result, primary caregivers have been allowed to establish grow operations inside homes within the city's single family residential zoning districts. Under the authority of the MMMA and depending on the number of patients being cared for by a registered primary giver, the legal grow limit can be as high as 72 plants. This includes 12 plants per patient with up to five patients per caregiver, plus another 12 plants for the caregiver. However, in a recent ruling, the Michigan Supreme Court confirmed the local municipality's authority to regulate caregiver and patient plant cultivation under the MMMA. The court's decision means that local governments may regulate medical marijuana cultivation by MMA licensed caregivers and patients through zoning and other regulatory ordinances, provided they do not prohibit or penalize the cultivation of medical marijuana or impose regulations that are unreasonable or in contradiction to the MMA standards. <clears throat> the language amendments as prepared, prepared by the law department will do the following. One, provide a definition for caregiver grow facility. This would be under section 2.10. Two, 
that would prohibit caregiver grow facilities in all R1 through R5 single family residential zoning districts. This would be under section 4.12. It would also prohibit caregiver grow facilities in all rural urban farm zoning districts under section 5.15. And then lastly, allow caregiver grow facilities as a permitted use in all M1 light manufacturing zoning districts. And this would be in section 16.02. Livonia currently has multiple caregiver growth facilities located in our industrial district. Uh, in buildings where more than one caregiver operates, the inspection department does require that each caregiver grow facility be in a locked unit with a separate access, separate address, as, uh, as well as separate metering. The city does not track caregiver grow operations in residential dwellings. Larger grow operations inside homes can become a nuisance and be dangerous since the city is usually not called for inspections involving changes to mechanical systems. In fact, recently a home in Livonia was destroyed by fire due to an electrical fire caused by improper wiring associated with the grow operation. To the question at the study meeting regarding nonconformities, the city law department has indicated that caregiver grow operations that are in existence at the time this or any other zoning ordinance is passed, prohibiting the use in residential districts will in fact be grandfathered and considered a valid non-conforming use and hence allowed to continue. Um, so that answers that question that came up at our study session, uh, Mr. Chairman. And I, we do have just one item of correspondence. It's, it's from our, it's from the inspection department dated to August 10th indicating that they have no objection uh, with this petition. So. If there are any questions at this time, I'd be happy to, uh, to answer them. Thank you, Mr. Toramina. Uh, this is a petition generated by the city council. So it's the city's own petition. So we don't have a petitioner here. Um, if there is any, we'll start with any questions by any of the commissioners for our planning staff, and then we'll go to our audience. Any questions for the planning staff? Chairman. Mr. Ventura. Uh, Mr. Taramina, can you tell us what constitutes a caregiver? What constitutes a caregiver? Yeah, what so they, they would have to be, they would have to be um, properly licensed or registered with the state of Michigan. And and if somebody's licensed with the state of Michigan, does is the city aware of that? No, we are not aware of all licensed caregivers that I am aware of. Is there a way for us to become aware or to require them to register with the city? So that's a great question. And it really um, is something the legal department is investigating currently as part of this uh, question of establishing uh, valid non-conforming use status to any pre-existing uh, caregiver grow operations in homes. And uh, one way of doing that would be through some sort of registration process, uh, allowing a certain time either uh, post adoption of the ordinance or, or just prior to the adoption of, of an ordinance, um, prohibiting the, the use in residential districts to allow those caregiver operations currently in existence to register with the city so that we would have those on file in the event that there's any question later on as to whether or not they're considered a valid not conforming use or uh, illegal under the terms of the ordinance. So um, that's kind of a long answer to your question, uh, uh, but it is something our, our law <coughs> is going to be looking at as this uh, petition moves forward uh, for review by city council. That's a good answer, Mr. Carmina. One last question, um, is there, are there any plans once the grandfathered growing facilities are identified to, are there any plans on the city's part to inspect them to see if they conform and are safe? In, in, in homes, the answer uh, that uh, I'm not aware of any plans. Uh, certainly inspections are done as, as part of any commercial operation uh, that seeks a permit and the zoning compliance um, status with the city. So. Uh, th that 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 process is, is has been underway for for a couple of years now as it relates to our uh, um, industrial district operations, but not that I'm aware of in the residential. 
once a registration is done, um, whether there'd be any inspection, I, I can't say. I, I suspect there would not be. And, and finally, um, I, I'm assuming that when we say in a home, it would include an outbuilding like a garage or a shed on the property or something like that. You know, I'm not um, familiar enough with the um, MMA, MMMA um, rules and regulations as, as it pertains to the lawful um, conduct of uh, these, these caregiver grill operations and whether or not, I know that they have to be in a locked facility if that allows them to be uh, to, um, uh, to be established in outbuildings, uh, I'm not fully aware of that. I suspect uh, they 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 can be, but it, it still has to meet all the other rules rules and requirements, including uh, again uh, security and 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 not accessible to anyone other than the uh, the homeowner caregiver themselves. Uh, thank you, Mr. Tormina. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Ventura. Uh, this is Smiley. I think we have a few other people with questions as well. So we'll okay. start with this is Smiley. Okay, uh, my question is if uh, somebody has one of these facilities and they have a license or the permission to grow one, um, if some if they decide they want to get out of the business for some reason, uh, can do they have to go through anything to hand it over to the second owner? You know how we put a waiver or something in, you know, when it's a waiver use, they have to for people again to make sure that they meet all the regulations? You know, I, I'm going to assume that you're speaking only to uh, an operation in a, in a commercial, in yeah. a, a commercial um, establishment like an M1 property. But the answer is, uh, could the, could it, could, could a, it be transferred to another from one caregiver to another I see no reason why that couldn't happen. Now that's not being done under the auspice of, of, of the city um, and the zoning process. Uh, what that might require, uh, if it's a change in ownership or a change in tenancy, uh, would be a new zoning compliance permit being issued. So it depends on the, the individual circumstance in terms of what would be required as far as um, uh, notification to the city and any follow-up inspections if there's any changes with the operation itself. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Smiley. Uh, I think Mrs. McHugh. Right, I just want to clarify something. Right now we said there is no inspection uh, process at all for anybody that is, is designated as, as, as growing for medical needs in their houses or in, in their homes, correct? There's no inspection protocol correct Critical inspection protocol that is correct if, if you are a homeowner who would otherwise want to, not for the grow operation itself but if you make mechanical changes uh, whether it's plumbing or electrical uh, then you're obligated under our building codes to, to obtain a permit for those like um, any other business is that being done you know I I, I, I can't answer it I, I probably probably not to the extent that it should be done for these types of operations, which is the reason, one of the reasons why we've had issues and problems uh, like the recent fire I mentioned. So correct me if I'm wrong or if I'm not understanding this, this correctly, but for us to move this forward, this would actually just give us better checks and balances within the city um, as far as inspections and typical business protocols <clears throat> that we handle, that we would use with all other businesses within the city. Am I correct? You know, it, it really won't change much uh, as it relates to uh, com operations occurring in the industrial district. It, it memorializes it to the extent that it establishes the rule that, that doesn't currently exist. But the city has, up to this point, it said uh, uh, caregiver grow operations uh, can locate anywhere uh, as a result of um, what was the interpretation of the, of the statute. With the recent court ruling, however, communities now have the authority to to further regulate uh, the siting or the location <clears throat> where our facilities locate. Okay. So we're taking advantage of that uh, court decision and our um, authority under zoning rules 
to establish these regulations. It doesn't change it uh, as it relates to the industrial um, aspect, but it certainly will for residential by, by prohibiting them altogether in single family districts. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. McHugh. Any other questions for our planning staff? Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Caramagno. Mark, this is for Mark. Mark, in a, in a, in a manufactured zoning area, um, is there a limit to how many plants you can have per caregiver? And can multiple caregivers lease a space under a, in a, in a sectioned off large building? Yeah, so uh, that that is something we're seeing. Um, to answer the first part of your question, there is a limit. Caregivers are restricted uh, to the number I referenced earlier, 72 plants, uh, but that doesn't prohibit multiple caregivers uh, from leasing units in, a, in, in an industrial building where you would effectively have um, several caregivers, a consortium of caregivers, if you will, uh, operating in separate locked units within a large industrial building. And uh, we are seeing that. Uh, there are some buildings that have six to eight uh, caregivers uh, uh, per building. Uh, there are others with, where just one uh, caregiver is operating in a small unit within the industrial district. So it varies, but yes, um, um, there's a limit and uh, they can, um, they can group together in, under a single roof. Is there a square footage allotment they have to have per caregiver or can it look like a forest inside of a building? You know, um, <clears throat> there's, there's no minimum standard that I'm aware of, uh, but certain codes would govern, I think, in terms of aisleway widths, clearances. Uh, there's, uh, in some cases, suppression requirements, depending on the, the, the size of the building. Uh, so um, usually these things are dictated by other codes, not, not any that I'm aware of that are specific to um, the cultivation of, of plants. Um, so okay. there's, other, there's other health, health and safety codes that um, come into play, put it that way, uh, that have to be uh, met. You know, the challenge here is, is, you know, a plant starts out as a seedling and, you know, by the time it's uh, mature, it, it's a certain size that now you know it had that has to be accounted for in terms of uh in, in terms of some of the issues like uh, uh you know uh, heights and, and aisleway widths and, and that sort of thing and not interfering with other systems in the building all right mark thank you thank you mr caramagno uh any other questions for our planning staff mr chair mr bongero just a question for mark um mark so as i understand it then if this gets if this gets passed, anything as of now would be grandfathered in its place, right? Then going forward, it would all be pushed to M1. M1 and M2. Yeah, so so that that's basically correct. Um, you know, uh, theoretically, you're right. You know, the the um, everything that's in existence would would uh, continue. Uh, or could continue, um, and then M1 and M2 would continue to see um, caregiver grow operations. Uh, you know, would be treated as a permitted use, so they would come and go within that uh, within those two zoning districts. That's okay. Correct. So, have they discussed like what would deter someone from just like bootlegging the facility, and if they get caught, what kind of penalties are in place? I mean, is that something that that you know about or no? You know, and you're talking about residential, I'm assuming, and, and that is something yeah. that I'm not, um, quite frankly, it's a, you know, those would go into the, the uh, penalties of the zoning ordinance, uh, which are, 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 you know, I'm not sure which are criminal and, and otherwise uh, or civil, uh, but but yes, it would fall under our zoning ordinance, the, 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 the penalty section of, of the zoning ordinance. Gotcha, okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bongero. Uh, Mrs. Smiley, I believe, has another question. I do. Um, well, if this goes through, how long before this is, for example, the uh, the phrase that we put in there that they be um, the growth facilities are limited to single-use buildings, so they don't contaminate the whole building for everybody else. When would this go into effect? 
So that you, what you just uh, referenced was a um, one of the conditions in the prepared resolution, and this was an issue that was discussed at the study meeting. Uh, the the question was whether or not uh, we should be allowing these facilities in in multi unit multi tenant buildings. So we did we put language in the prepared resolution that would restrict them to single use buildings only. I think that was. Uh, recommended by the Planning Commission. Uh, these would go in effect once the ordinance, the, the second reading. So as you know, council has to hold a public hearing on this, uh, the, regardless of whatever language they fabric, you know, create at the end, uh, there has to be a first reading uh, on the ordinance amendment, followed by a second reading and a roll call vote. Once that's done, the ordinance becomes effective upon publication of the minutes approving uh, the, the, uh, the roll call vote. So, you know, it could be two months from now, it could be four months from now, uh, depending on how quickly the council moves through this process. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Smiley. Uh, any other questions for our staff? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ventura. Uh, a couple of things. Um, <clears throat> we're using the word single use. And I think our, I think we should change the term to single tenant. A permitted use is anything that's permitted in the M1 zoning district. And so that doesn't restrict it to a single tenant building. So I think our, our resolution should say single tenant building occupied by a single user, single tenant, single lease, so that, so that you can't somebody can't come along and say, well, there are 10 units here and they're all the same use, they're all M1. <clears throat> um, that would, I think, tighten up the recommendation to the council to limit it to individual buildings, freestanding buildings with a single tenant. Um, secondly, I'm concerned, um, Mr. Tormina, about uh, your inclusion of M2 properties. Uh, in the industrial section in town, M2 properties under our current, current zoning allow outdoor activities, which would mean that if somebody's growing in an M2 zoning district, they could be growing outside. And um, <clears throat> there are, there are, um, according to the to uh, the industrial real estate business, there are far too few M2 zoned uh, properties that allow outdoor storage, outdoor uses of any kind. Um, and if we start putting marijuana in these buildings and these guys start growing outside, that's going to soak up even more of a very scarce product. And finally, um, in our study session, we talked about uh, <clears throat> what happens to the marijuana grown by medical growers, uh, by caregivers, that their patients don't use, don't consume. And there was some discussion about the fact that it was then um, permissible under state law or under some ruling that it went to resident or went to recreational use. And so you could grow with abandon for medical use. And if you couldn't sell it there, you all of a sudden were a supplier to recreational marijuana. And I wonder if anything has happened since our study session to clarify that situation. Uh, yes, all good questions. I'll take them one at a time. So the the, the first um, suggestion I think is a great one, and 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 so I um, we'll work on the uh, the language. And I'm assuming that any resolution approving this will uh, will make that uh, recommendation. Secondly, as far as outdoor growing. Uh, I believe that is that is prohibited under statute. So all these activities have to occur within a an enclosed uh, building under the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act. I, I'm not aware that that statute allows for any outdoor grow operations, but we can certainly uh, verify that. And uh, the fact that M2 is included is is because it's it's automatic that any permitted use uh, or waiver use for that matter in an M1 zoning automatically carries over and is treated as a permitted use uh, within the M2 district. But, I, but again, I don't believe outdoor grow ops are, are something that is allowed under, under state law. And then lastly, still, still an unanswered question, uh, Mr. Ventura. I, uh, I, I did some digging 
in the week between um, our meeting here. And interesting uh, that um, the, the, the sales of both adult use recreational as well as medical marijuana in, in, the, in the last couple of months has gone from about a, a one or $2 million per week industry to almost a 12 to $14 million per week industry in the state of Michigan. And, and this includes uh, both facets. So in my conversations with some people, they don't believe that it is a something that is being allowed right now to see these um, uh, any surplus come out of the caregivers go directly to the adult use recreational market. Uh, uh, the thought is that uh, there's just a, a, such an increasing uh, demand even on the uh, on this side, the medical side, that it uh, that it is the reason why we're seeing so many of these grow operations. Uh, but that's not to say that there isn't some black market occurring. We uh, we don't know the answer to that fully. But I'm not aware of any conduit that the that the Lara uh, the licensing uh, agency for the state has made available to to cross uh, from one market, um, you know, uh, medical over to adult use. I'm, I'm, we're not aware of that. Um, we still have some more research to do on that. So hopefully that answers your question. It, it is it is somewhat befuddling because here at the city we're faced with a a recent uh, um, uh, uh, push, you know, demand for space. Uh, we get calls every week uh, about um, the possibility of opening up, you know, a building in the industrial district, even commercial district, uh, and um, you know we, we're seeing several applications come in uh, for buildings in the industrial district. We had a quite a lengthy discussion about this on uh, last week, so uh, that hasn't slowed, and uh, much of it is just driven by the sheer demand. Uh, thank you, Mr. Tormina, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Ventura, Mr. Tormina. Uh, and it is a good good thing to just let uh, folks in our audience know that uh, we did have a, a healthy discussion about this last week. And one of the elements that came out of that discussion was uh, in our prepared resolution and Mr. Ventura uh, has uh, helped to further refine that in terms of making sure that uh, we do have a lot of different users in um, the industrial uh, zoned areas, different types of users of these properties, uh, different industrial uses, and we also have some uh, recreational athletic uses that we've started to allow in these zonings, such as dance studios and uh, gymnasium type facilities. And our um, concern is that we don't want to have uh, those facilities uh, impacted in any way by uh, these caregiver grow facilities uh, being next door in a shared building uh, where odors and other um, uh, issues may may bleed over from from one tenant to another. So uh, so I think they've we've further refined this proposed uh, zoning change or ordinance changes, and I, I think for the better. Uh, to protect the other users in these uh, industrial uh, zoning um, buildings. So uh, is there any other questions for uh, our planning department at this point from the commission? If not, is there anyone in the audience wishing to speak for or against this item? If so, please uh, click raise hand. If you're connected by telephone, uh, you can use uh, star nine, I think it is to uh, use the raise hand feature. This is a public hearing, so we always like to make sure we give uh, anyone in the audience a chance to speak on these items. I don't see anyone raising their hand uh, on this item, so uh, I'll go back to the commission for one last round. If there's anyone with any questions or comments uh, of Mr. Tormina or our planning staff, you're free to ask them. If not, I will close the public hearing and a motion will be in order. Mr. Chair. Mrs. Smiley. Okay. I guess I'm unmuted. Um, uh, I would like to make an approving resolution that the request to amend 
sections 2.10 of Article 2, 4, 12 of Article 4, 5.15 in Article 5, and 16.02 of Article 16 to define the Caregiver Grove facility and regulate the zoning districts where uh, medical marijuana facilities can operate is hereby approved for the following reasons uh, with, and with the following recommendations. That the proposed language amendments establish reasonable regulations that will govern where marijuana caregiver grow operations can operate in the city of Livonia. That the proposed amendments impose regulations that are consistent with the state law and that the proposed amendments are in the best interest of the safety and welfare of the community and that the city council consider adding language to section 16.02 that a restricts the caregiver grow facilities to single use industrial buildings to minimize nuisance odors caused by these types of business operations and imposes and b imposes a separation requirement from certain types of land uses, including schools, parks, and indoor recreational uses. And Mrs. Smiley, you're, you're uh, suggesting in your language that we incorporate the suggestions that Mr. Ventura offered in regards to uh, making sure that this is a, a, a single building for this single tenant, right? Yes, um, is there some way I need to rewrite that, Mark? so that it's as uh, Commissioner Ventura suggested? I think we just change it from single use to single tenant. Is that, would, okay. that would, do you think that would satisfy your concern, uh, Mr. Ventura? Uh, I prefer it say single tenant freestanding. There you go. Just make it crystal clear. Fine. All right, Mrs. Smiley is okay with that. Uh, is there support for this motion? All right, we have a motion uh, to approve, provided by Mrs. Smiley, supported by Mrs. McHugh. Uh, is there any discussion on this motion? Had quite a bit already tonight, and it was a good discussion. I appreciate everyone's contributions uh, to this uh, issue. If there's no discussion and the secretary is ready, please call the roll. Mrs. Smiley. Aye. Mrs. McHugh. Aye. Mr. Bajero? Aye. Mr. Long? Aye. Mr. Ventura? Aye. Chair Magna votes aye. Chair Wilshaw? Votes aye. And the motion is passed. We'll go on to City Council with a, uh, the intended language that uh, we've modified, and we'll let them uh, decide what to do with it. So thank you all for. Uh, the participation in this item that brings us to the end of the public hearing section of our agenda. We now move on to miscellaneous items. Item number four, Mr. Secretary. Petition 2020-07-08-05 submitted by Bellagio Homes Inc. Requesting approval of the master deed bylaws and site plan pursuant to section 18.62 of the city of Livonia zoning ordinance number 543 as amended to develop a site condominium, Livonia Manor 3, consisting of four single family homes on the northern 300.62 feet of the property at 31670 Seven Mile Road, located on the north side of Seven Mile Road between Merriman Road and Osmus Avenue in the southeast quarter of section three. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, Mr. Tormina. Thank you again. This is a request for approval of a master deed bylaws and site plan for a site condominium consisting of four single family homes. Its location is on the north side of Seven Mile between Shrewsbury and Canterbury Streets. And as you can see from the map, this property is in the process of being rezoned from RUF to R1 one family residential. Council gave first reading to the rezoning on July 20th and the second reading and roll call, which are the final steps in the rezoning process are on hold pending a review of this site plan. <clears throat> R1 zoning requires a minimum lot size of 7,200 uh, square feet. For the lot width, the minimum is 60 feet, and for the lot depth, the minimum is 120 feet. Abutting the site to the east is Livonia Manor 1, and to the west is Livonia Manor 2. Both are site condominiums built by the same developers. 
Bridge Street, as you can see, serves both developments ending on each side of the subject property. The proposed plan would allow for the continuation of Bridge Street through the site, forming connections at both ends and a single horseshoe shaped road linking all three site condominiums developments. The extension of Bridge Street <clears throat> would have a width of 50 feet, which matches uh, the width of the existing right of way. Two lots, as you can see, would be developed on the north side of Bridge and two on the south side for a total of four. All four lots would meet the minimum size requirements of the R1 zoning district. Existing public water main, sanitary, and storm sewers are available to serve the new development. The building and use restrictions outlined in the submitted master deed and bylaws for Livonia Manor 3 are consistent with the building and use restrictions contained in the master deed and bylaws for both Livonia Manor 1 and Livonia Manor 2. These include minimum percentage of brick and other design standards as well as minimum house sizes and other use restrictions pertaining to the garages, outbuildings, and other lot improvements. So with that, Mr. Chairman, um, we have a, a few items of correspondence I'd like to read out. Yes, please. Uh, the first letter comes from our Department of Public Safety. It's dated July 29th, and it reads, uh, it indicates that they have no objections to the proposal. That is signed by uh, Sergeant Scott Shapansky of the Traffic Bureau. Next is a letter coming, a uh, uh, letter of no objection from the inspection department dated August 10th and signed by Jerome Hanna, director of inspection. Uh, next is a letter from our department of finance dated July 21st. That reads, I have reviewed the address connected with the above noted petition. The following amounts are due by the city to the city of Livonia. Unpaid water and sewer charges in the amount of $478.87. And that letter is signed by Connie Kumpula, chief accountant, Next is a letter, letter of no objection coming from a, the Office of Treasurer dated July 21st and signed by Linda Scheel, Treasurer of the City of Livonia. And then lastly, a letter from our Department of Assessment dated July 22nd that reads, the proposed site plans for Livonia Manor 3 condominiums occupy a portion of parcel number 012-99-0008-000 with address 31670 Seven Mile Road. This parcel currently has a residential home on it and a rear structure that falls within the boundaries of the newly proposed development according to the aerial map. A lot split would be initiate, should be initiated in order to split off the northerly 300.62 feet of the parcel. That letter is signed by Kathy Sitterlitt from the Department of Assessment and that is the extent of the correspondence. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tarmina. Do we have any questions for our planning staff? Uh, Mr. Chair? This is Smiley. Yeah, who owns the who owns, so, uh, unpaid water bill? Who's that belong to? I am going to uh, defer that question to the petitioner. Okay, thank you. All right, we'll get an answer on that in a moment then. Any other questions for our planning staff? Uh, if I, there's no other questions for the planning staff, uh, the petitioner, I believe, is in the audience. We will uh, welcome Mr. Suave again. Good evening. Once again, I'm DJ Suave for the, for the petitioner tonight. We triple seven one seven mile race from the city of Bologna, four eight one five two. Uh, follow up in regards to the unpaid water and sewer bill. Um, that was paid last week after one or two phone calls to the tenant in possession. So that has since been paid. I'm not sure what the data is. Mr. Uh, okay, you're having some audio issues. Oh boy, can you hear me okay? We hear you, but you're uh, quite muffled. Is that any better? No, it's not. No. We're hearing some weird echoes and uh, feedback, I think. Is that any better, Mr. Chair? Sure. You may, you may want to try better. reconnecting your audio. Hmm. How about now? Um, a little better, but you, please. Please. Yeah. It's a little difficult when you have young kids in the house, Mr. Chair. How about now? 
Feel pretty bad. Hmm. I don't know what to tell you because the internet Wi Fi is showing in a chill service, so maybe since I walked in the draw tonight. And if she continues, I can always call back from the from landline. You may want to try phoning into the meeting if you uh, if you can't get your audio uh, sorted out so that we can uh, hear you clearly. So you can hear me, so I'm, I'm definitely my microphone is working, but there seems to be a connection issue for that stretch. It's going to be difficult to proceed if we can't uh, have a conversation with you. We'll give Mr. Suave a moment to work on his audio issues there. Uh, is there any questions from any of the planning commissioners at this point for Mr. Tormina? Mr. Suave has been muted. I believe he's going to try dialing in your telephone so that way we can uh, hear him clearly. Mr. Chairman, I've uh, sent a message to Mr. Suave. Hopefully he'll reconnect here. Okay, great. Apologize. That's okay. Well, we're trying to make this technology work. Is there uh, Mr. Suave, has he been reconnected at this point? I'm not sure if I see him yet. Okay, let me, uh, let me try uh, this connection here. If uh, do we have Mr. Can Suave, you guys hear me okay? We hear you now. All right, okay. Where, where we leave off of in, during this technical difficulty. Uh, you're loud and clear now, so you may as well just start over. Uh, oh, unpaid water bills. That, yeah. uh, what was the day of that correspondence? That was paid last week, and that was no fault of our own. That was a, a tenant that uh, we made a phone call to, and he promptly paid that last week. So can you identify with the day of that correspondence? with uh, unpaid water and sewer charges for that resident on the property? July 21st. Yeah, that, that has since been paid. Okay, thank you for letting us know that. Uh, anything else you'd like to tell us about your site plan for these four homes? Uh, site plan is pretty straightforward. Um, single family R1 lots with, uh, I'm not sure if Mark showed uh, any of the um, elevations of homes were proposed to put on there. They're similar homes we've built in the past year, two years within the city and very similar uh, size, um, elevation and brick requirements in Livonia Manor 1 and 2, which we also built homes in there as well. As you speak, so he is showing those. Okay, great. I mean, there's only four units here, so this should be a quick turnaround from, you know, the inception of the development um, home to the completion. So we're anticipating a 12-month turnaround time for all four units. Okay, and Mr. Uh, Suave, during our uh, meeting for the rezoning, uh, we heard some questions from the audience at that time, and some of those folks are with us again this evening. I want to give them another chance to speak, but uh, some of the questions were around uh, the fencing, how that's going to be handled, mailboxes, and some of those other connections to the properties, either to the east or west. Can you speak to that a little bit? Uh, well, the connection will be a thoroughfare, so you can, the public road, so anyone can access it from either Livonia Manor, Livonia Manor 1 or Livonia Manor 2, which is outside of our control. Uh, mailboxes, there's four houses there. 
Um, the best solution, you could put a cluster box of two mailboxes on one side of the street that resolves that any any issues there, but mailbox issues usually happen at the back end, not at the front end. So I'm not too concerned about four mailboxes. Um, fencing, any some of the fencing there needs to be replaced, and we'll replace that with uh, along with development with black chain link fence once uh, once we get started and completed with the homes. Okay, and I think one of the other questions that. Uh, uh, some of the residents had was about um, the association. Uh, this is going to be a separate association from either Livonia Manor 1 or Livonia Manor 2, correct? That's absolutely correct. It will be freestanding subdivision with um, virtually no really common areas. So it should have no adverse effect or impact um, financially uh, upon the, the existing, existing communities and neighbors. Um, actually, about a week ago, we had one of the homeowners, I think it was Livonia Manor 1, the person that came to the office and was uh, very, very nervous. The trees were in the process of falling on his on his home. So we sent a representative over there, assess the situation, and let him know that those trees will be uh, coming down shortly. So I know some people want to see the trees remain. Uh, other neighbors adjacent to are worried about some of the old trees there uh, being removed. So once this development gets started, we can start clearing out some of the trees in the affected areas. Okay, very good. Thank you, Mr. Suave. Uh, do we have any questions from the uh, commission for Mr. Suave, our petitioner? Mr. Chair? Mr. Bongero? Uh, just for Mr. Suave, Suave um, this is going to have its own association? That's correct, sir. So they'll pay, they'll have like fees whatever yearly fees that pay for snow removal and, and things like that. Correct. It's a public road. It's a public road. So the, uh, the taxpayer uh, will that be taken care of as part of their taxes. So the dues will be very nominal um, as there's not too many um, shared areas in this four unit development. But yeah, I'll speak to your, the answer your question that is in the affirmative. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bongero. Any other questions for our petitioner? I don't see any other questions for our petitioner at this time. Uh, is there any, anyone in the audience wishing to speak for or against this item? If you would like to, please click raise hand uh, in the Zoom application, or if you're connected by phone, dial star nine. We do have our first raised hand. This is gonna be the uh, phoned in caller. The phone number ending 4838. Please, uh, please dial star six to unmute and you can uh, introduce yourself. Hello. Hi, we hear you. Hi, uh, my name is David Mobus. I live at 19142 Shrewsbury. Um, my backyard will back up to the yard of one of the. Mr. Uh, we, we got you on mute there. there. There you go. There we go. Um, there name is David, David Mobus. Uh, live at 19142 Shrewsbury. Um, our backyard will back up to one of the new houses on the north, or excuse me, the south side. Um, my first question is, if this uh, site plan is passed, will this still go before the city council for final approval? Yes, we are a recommending body, so uh, any decision that we make is simply a recommendation to council. They make the ultimate decision. Okay. Um, because everybody that we've dis we've talked with in Livonia Manor one and two that this affects are totally against this. Um, there's multiple reasons. Both subdivisions have young children playing. Uh, we have a lot of young kids. Um, putting a through street in here is going to cause nothing but problems with people just you know, speeding through, using it as a turnaround. You know, I, I mean, I know you guys can't control that, but in a way you can by not passing this. Uh, second, we've got a ton of wildlife in the uh, area that's going to be torn out. Uh, I had seven deer back there yesterday. Um, you know, it, it's, it's kind of, you know, nobody's listening to the residents. Uh, we had a petition that went through. 
to stop this. Nobody, nobody listened to us. You know, we're, we're, we're getting lip service, but we're not getting what the, what the residents and the taxpayers are asking for. And I understand he wants to build four homes, but what are four homes when he's already building, you know, how many hundreds throughout the rest of the city? You know, it's, it's not, you know, going to be good rapport with the neighbors. We had one couple that just moved in on Bridge Street because it was a dead end street and it was quiet. Now they're finding out that it's not going to be. It's just nobody's listening to the residents. Well, we, we hear you, Mr. Mobis, and I, I do believe uh, Mr. Tormina can clarify uh, if, if I'm incorrect, but uh, I believe your petition that the community filed has been received and uh, that will be a valid protest petition for the city council to make their decision. Is that correct, Mr. Tormina? That is correct. Okay. okay. So that now I do have a couple other questions. If this does go through, uh, mm -hmm. with the retention basin that we have on Livonia Manor 2. Are they going to be tied into that retention basin for storm drains, or are they going to have their own? Uh, we will ask the petitioner and get you an answer on that. It's a good question. And second, as far as fencing, um, you know, precedent's already been set with the home on the north uh, east corner of Shrewsbury that the builder paid for his privacy fence because they ended up building a, a, the last home on Shrewsbury that they weren't supposed to build initially. And he got them to pay for a privacy fence for that reason. So precedent has already been set with that as far as the fencing. Okay. And with our bylaws for this, for us, for Livonia Manor 2, um, if the fence stays the way it is, the fencing is allowed. If it's torn out and something new is put in, chain link fence is not allowed according to our bylaws. Right. I understand each of the uh, associations has a different set of uh, rules for you in regards to fencing. You know, and, you know, as far as the mailboxes, it was also discussed about possibly putting them over by ours on Livonia Manor, too. If they're going to put them over in front of their homes and, you know, have the boxes, that's fine as long as they're paying for it. You know, but, you know, this, this whole thing, and, you know, it's just kind of disturbing to the neighborhood because you know nobody wants this right and i, I appreciate your questions uh the, as far as the mailboxes go we did ask about that and uh those will remain on uh, the property of that development uh okay most likely because it's only four homes they won't have a large cluster mailbox but they'll have um, either single mailboxes for those four homes or double mailboxes on one side of the street well, and then I have one last thing. Um, we were told at the city council meeting that this was planned for Bridge Street to connect 15 years ago when this was first an in inception. Mm -hmm. I don't understand how it could have been a plan 15 years ago when neither the city nor the builder or any builder owned that land that they want to go through now. I, I don't understand how it could have been planned at that point. And if that's the lake they're standing on, they're, they're, there's not much to stand on based on not owning the property. And I understand it's been sold since then, but you can't retro back to 15 years when they didn't own the property or anybody owned the property that's involved. And using that as a standard to say, yeah, we're going to go through, and it was planned 15 years ago. Right. Well, I, I understand uh, your point. I can't, I can't speak for whoever said said whatever they said that was the president the president and the vice president of your city council okay well I'll, because I'll i was told because i was told that because i didn't do my due diligence when we had our home built um and looking into it i didn't do my due diligence so it was my fault and that was i was told that by the president oh well uh i'll, I'll leave that conversation between you and them um <laughs> I figured you would. <laughs> I, I, I would, yeah, I'm not going to speak for anybody else, but I do appreciate your uh, comments and your questions, Mr. Mobus, and we will try to get you an answer on the retention basin question that you asked. Now, if this does go through with you uh, tonight, when would the, when would the students for the city council? The, uh, if this is approved, it'll have to go to um, city council after our meet 
after our minutes are approved, which will be our next regular meeting, uh, okay. and then it can get placed on their agenda. So uh, Mr. Tormina can probably give you a better answer, but it's usually several weeks uh, before. Okay, so probably two to three weeks. Right. I think that's that's correct. Okay. So. All right. Well, I appreciate your time. Well, thank you, Mr. Mobis, uh, for dialing in tonight. And we will, you can continue to stay on and listen if you'd like. And we'll see if anyone else in the audience is wishing to speak for or against this item. Uh, please click raise hand if that's the case. And I don't, so we do have one other person, uh, Mrs. Johnson. Let me uh, click this button. You can unmute yourself and uh, welcome to our meeting. Hello, can everyone hear me? We hear you just great. Great, uh, thanks for hosting the meeting, first of all. Um, I'm also a resident in Livonia Manor too. Just wanted to add a couple thoughts. Um, also against this movement, um, several of the neighbors had um, issues, warranty issues with their houses when we moved in that, left un that were left unaddressed um, by the builders, um, which was pretty concerning. <laughs> um, I, I don't know if the city feels like it's in the city's best interest to continue encouraging or perpetuating this um, builders, I guess, expansion. Um, and I guess a question that kind of comes up in my mind with that is if there's damage to any of the houses or the streets or the yards during construction, who is accountable for that? Uh, the accountability is, is handled through bonds that the builder has to place when they start the project. There's a number of performance bonds, uh, bonds for sewers, roads, and other items. So if there's damage, uh, those are usually uh, handled out of those uh, things by the, our inspection and building departments. Okay, so it's it's not handled by um, Bellagio. Uh, well, the the builder Bellagio would have to post those bonds to the city, and then if there's any any reason that there's any any claims made against those bonds, mm -hmm. then those those are done that way. Uh, okay. If there is nothing, then those bonds are released uh, at the end of the project. Okay, I guess I'm only bringing that up because there, I mean, there was also a signed contract when we bought these houses that they would be back within the year to address our concerns and that never happened for several of us. So guess what, what's preventing them from doing that again? Yeah, I, I can relate to you. I, I've, uh, I live in a uh, development that uh, I built my own house and, and it's very common to see uh, issues arise with between the homeowners and developers toward the ends of projects. It's, it's a pretty common issue. And so I feel for you on that one. Um, uh, we can, we can talk to the developer, uh, or the petitioner, uh, when we get him back on the line here to ask about how he's going to, uh, provide some of those guarantees though. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson, for coming this evening. If, again, feel free to stay on and uh, listen if you'd like. Sure. Uh, is there anyone else in our audience wishing to speak for or against this item? If so, please click raise hand. I don't see uh, anyone else. So I'm gonna go back to uh, Mr. Suave, give him an opportunity to unmute himself. And you heard a question in regards to a uh, retention basins and how you're going to handle stormwater and then also uh, uh, ensure that uh, there's no damage to the existing properties to the east or west. The stormwater storm water will be handled on site. It will not be connecting to uh, the underground detentions in Livonia Manor 2. And Mr. Chair, you had it perfectly correct that the engineering department does require a significant amount of performance on uh, before anything is started in the project and nothing is returned until we do a final inspection um, at the completion of the units built. So they inspect it prior to and then they do a final inspection afterwards. And then in regards to uh, um, a warranty on the home, uh, 
are you offering a, a warranty to the homeowners and uh, how do you handle of course that? but I think there is there is two or three different builders in both of those communities so you can't you can't throw every you can't throw every builder into the same pot um, and say none of them uh, uh, are negligent in fulfilling any of their obligations we have an absolutely stellar reputation um, with our home buyers granted you can't have a hundred percent there's always some a few, uh, I'm not going to say bad apples, but sometimes you, in this business, you can't please everybody. Uh, um, anyone that's in business for themselves uh, understands that wholeheartedly, but uh, we have a very good reputation. Um, and I, ha- I can have a plethora of homeowners come forward and attest to that reputation if anyone should call upon that. Okay, thank you. But there's, a, there's, a stan- there's, a, there's a standard 12-month warranty to answer your question in brief. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, do we have any f- additional questions for our petitioner from the commission? I don't see any other questions. Mr. Suave, we'll give you the last word. Is there anything else you'd like to uh, say before we make our decision? Nothing further, Mr. Chair. I appreciate your time and the commission's time uh, this evening. Thank you so much. Again, thank you for coming and uh, sorting through those uh, audio issues we had at the beginning of this item uh, worked out okay. Uh, If there's no further questions, I will go to the commission and uh, look for a motion. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair uh, Caramagno, I've got a question for Mr. Swanee. Of course, Mr. Caramagno. Rico, uh, was there ever a time where, where you considered selling this property to the neighborhood? No, the question was never never brought up. Um, we purchased this property, and anyone can verify that uh, with the county or the or the city. We purchased the property back in October of 2019, um, and any and any realtor can go ahead and search the history uh, how long this property was on the market prior to us acquiring it. So it was available to everyone else, just like it was available to us. So uh, there is no, there is no um, underhanded or any kind of clandestine efforts to purchase this property. It was on the market for quite some time until we stumbled upon it for sale. Okay, so anybody could have bought this land and secured it as, uh, as uh, forested land and, uh, and had it just the way it sits today, but that's not the case. You bought the land. Correct. And, you can ver- and anyone can verify that to see when the property was listed for sale. And then when it eventually uh, was sold. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Caramagno. Uh, any other questions? Again, I don't see uh, any other questions. A motion would be in order then. Mr. Chair? Mrs. McHugh. Like to offer an approving resolution for the request to de- develop a site condominium Livonia, Livonia Manor 3 consisting of four single family homes on the northern 300.62 feet of the property at 16707 miles hereby approved, subject to city council approval and the following conditions. That the site plan identified as sheet one dated July 20th, 2020, prepared by RP Donnan Inc. is hereby approved and shall be adhered to. That the condominium master deed and bylaws comply with the requirements of the subdivision control ordinance, Title 16, Chapter 16.4 through 16.40 of the Livonia City Code of Ordinance, and Article XX, Section 20.01 through 20.06 of Zoning Ordinance Number 543. That the brick used in the construction of each condominium unit shall be a full-faced four-inch brick. In the event of a conflict between the provisions of set, for, set forth in the master deed and bylaws and the requirements set forth in the City of Livonia Zoning Ordinance Number 543 as amended, the zoning ordinance requirements shall prevail and petitioner shall comply with the zoning ordinance require, requirements. That the petitioner shall include language in the master deed and bylaws or separate recordable instrument wherein the condominium association shall reimburse the city of Livonia for any maintenance or repair costs incurred for the stormwater detention slash retention and outlet facilities and giving and giving the city of Livonia the right to impose liens on each lot, 
each lot owner's property pro rata and place said charges on their real estate tax bills in the event that said charges are not paid by the condominium association or each, or each lot owner within 30 days of billing for the city of Livonia. That all required cash deposit certified checks, irrevocable bank letters of credit, and or surety bonds, which shall be established by the city engineer pursuant to art Article XV111 of Ordinance Number 543, Section 18.66 of the ordinance shall be deposited with the city prior to the issuance of the engineering permits for the site condominium development. Pursuant to Section 19.10 of Ordinance Number 543, the, the zoning ordinance of the city of Livonia, this approval is valid for a period of one year from the date of approval by city council. And unless a building permit is obtained, this approval shall be null and void at the expiration of said period. Thank you, Mrs. McHugh. Is there support? Support. Or, all right, I hear lots of support. Uh, I heard Mrs. Smiley first, so we're gonna go with Mrs. McHugh on the approving resolution supported by Mrs. Smiley. Is there any discussion on this motion? If there's no discussion, uh, Mr. Secretary, please call the roll. Mr. Smiley. Or Mr. Aye. Mrs. McHugh, I'm sorry. That's fine. Aye. Mr. Smiley, I got you. Mr. Bonjero. Aye. Mr. Long. Aye. Mr. Ventura. Aye. Chair Magno votes aye. Chair Mulshaw. Votes aye. And the motion passes. We'll go on the city council with a approving recommendation. And uh, I want to thank the folks in our audience uh, for attending tonight. I'm going to give uh, uh, Mr. Sove uh, one chance to uh, uh, say good night. But uh, thank you, for everyone, for coming this evening on this item. Uh, please follow this on to the City Council, where it'll be discussed and voted on by them as well. Uh, if there's no further discussion on this item, then we're all set. So thank you for attending. Um, with that, we now then move on to item number five on our agenda, which is going to be the next two items are extensions of uh, plans. So, Mr. Secretary. Petition 2019-04-02-05, submitted by Piano Shoe Properties, LLC, requesting a one-year extension of all plans in connection with a proposal to utilize a micro brewer license, including redeveloping the site expanding the parking lot and modifying the exterior facade of the existing building in connection with the operation of a brew pub at 27717 and 27719 Seven Mile Road, located on the south side of Seven Mile Road between Inkster and Harrison Avenue in the northeast quarter of Section 12. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Mr. Tormina? Uh, this is an extension that involves uh, a site plan and waiver use that was approved uh, last year for uh, what was referred to then as Piano Shoe Brewery. As you can see from the zoning map, uh, the property is located at the southeast corner of Deering and Seven Mile. Uh, it's a small building on the property that was um, scheduled to be run, uh, completely renovated uh, into, a, uh, into a brew pub. Uh, the, um, the operation or the, uh, the site plan also included a new parking lot, an outdoor beer garden. Uh, we spent considerable time reviewing this uh, petition uh, it was approved by planning commission as well as council. Uh, the petitioner in, in the letter explains that uh, due to the uh, pandemic, operations were halted uh, from early March 2020 uh, to just recently. And this would allow them the time to, to get qualified contractors and obtain uh, building permits. Uh, there are no major changes or, or changes uh, affecting the, uh, the plans. So it's strictly an extension of what we previously approved. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tarmina. And there's no uh, additional communication from- uh, Letters of no objection from the treasurer, from uh, finance department, inspection department, uh, and that's it. Okay, great, thank you. Any questions of our uh, planning department? If not, uh, Mr. Schumacher, I believe is in the audience this evening. He's one of the uh, petitioners. I am. How's my audio? You sound great. Thank you. Yes, I have really nothing more to add other than the clause for just granting 
Coppersmith Brewing LLC to be added for utilizing that microbrewer license for the Michigan Liquor Control Commission to grease the skids on getting that allocated for this address. Yes, and we do have in our uh, the language of our approving resolution, we do have uh, both property names listed. So that will be part of that, uh, assuming that goes forward. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you for reminding us on that, just in case. Uh, any questions of our petitioner uh, who's with us this evening from the Planning Commission? Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Bonjero. Uh, Mr. Schumacher, when do you anticipate getting building permits? We are approximately three or four weeks out from getting permits. Okay, and I think you were anticipating being done by spring of next year? Summer? Yes, that is our anticipated timeline. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bongero. Any other questions for our petitioner? I don't hear any other questions. Anyone in the audience wishing to speak on this item? Please use the raise hand feature. I don't see any hands going up. Uh, Mr. Schumacher, I think we have heard what we need to for this item. Uh, is there anything else you would like to add before we make our decision? Nothing at this time. Thank you for your time. Great, thank you. Uh, if there's no other questions or comments, I'll go to the commission for a motion. Mr. Sure. Chairman. I heard Mr. Bongero first. Go ahead. I would like to offer an approving resolution that the request for a one-year extension of the plans approved in connection with a proposal to utilize a microbrewer license, including redeveloping the site, expanding the parking lot, and modifying the exterior facade of the existing building in connection with the operation of a brew pub, Piano Shoe Properties, LLC, Cooper Smith Brewing, LLC, at 27717 and 277197 Mile Road, subject to City Council approval and the following conditions. One, that the request for a one-year extension of waiver use approval by Piano Shoe Properties, LLC, Cooper Smith Brewery, LLC, a letter dated July 1, 2020, is hereby approved. Two, that all, all conditions imposed by council resolution number 243-19 in connection with petition 2019-04-02-05, which permitted the utilization of a microbrewer license in connection with the operation of a brew pub, including redeveloping the site, expanding the parking lot, and modifying the exterior facade of the bu existing building at 27717 and 277197 Mile Road, shall remain in effect to the extent that they are not in conflict with the foregoing condition, and three, that all conditions imposed by council resolution number 244-19 in, in connection with petition 2019-04-02-05, which waived the separation requirement as set forth in sections 10.03-J2 and 19.06, one shall remain in effect to the extent that they are not in conflict with the foregoing condition. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bongero. Do we have support? Support. support. All right. I heard Mr. Ventura on the support. Um, is there any uh, questions or comments on the, uh, the motion that's on the floor? To Mr. Approve? Chairman. Mr. Schumacher. Yes, I would like to confirm that it is Coppersmith Brewing and not Coopersmith Brewing. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I can't read. That's okay. Coopersmith <laughs> is Cooper out Smith. of Colorado. Cooper Smith. Okay, sorry about that. Yes, Thank we you. Have, we have Coopersmith, C-O-P-P-E-R, -C -O which is actually Coppersmith. Yeah, Coppersmith, yeah. Thank okay. you. Very good. English is uh, not always our... <laughs> Our strong suit in this uh, commission. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other questions or comments before we uh, take a roll call on this? If there's nothing else, uh, Mr. Secretary, please call the roll. Uh, you need to unmute yourself. Sure do, Mr. Bongero. Aye. Mr. Ventura. Aye. Mrs. Smiley. Aye. 
Mrs. McHugh. Aye. Mr. Long. Aye. Chair Manuel votes aye. Chair Wolshaw. Votes aye. The motion passes. Go on to the city council with an approving recommendation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Schumacher, for coming this evening. And uh, we wish you luck with your uh, project still. Uh, and with that, uh, Mr. Uh, Secretary, we'll go on to our next item. Petition 2019-05-02-08, submitted by Livonia Healthcare Real Estate, LLC. They're requesting a one-year extension of all plans in connection with the proposal to demolish the existing nursing home, St. Jude, and construct a new building in its place for the purpose of operating a nursing and physical rehabilitation facility named Mission Point Livonia at 34350 Ann Arbor Trail, located on the north side of Ann Arbor Trail between Joy Road and Stark Road and the southeast corner of section number 33. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Mr. Tormina. Thank you again. Uh, this is a request uh, for a one-year extension of plans uh, involving the redevelopment of the former St. Jude, St. Jude uh, nursing home uh, located on Ann Arbor Trail. Um, council granted the approval of the waiver use on uh, August 26th of last year. Uh, and uh, the, the development replaces the old building with a new two-story uh, building that's about 44,000 square feet in size. Same number of licensed bed uh, in the facility, 64. Uh, the petitioner indicates in a letter to the Planning Commission that um, Due to COVID-19, uh, uh, that has delayed the project, but that they're still eager to move forward uh, with the goal of starting construction in the spring of 2021. I will point out that a significant issue that remains unresolved is the payment of uh, late taxes and fees. Um, if uh, you allow me, I'll read the correspondence um, on, this, on these issues. Sure. Uh, in a letter dated July 21st from our finance department, they indicate uh, that they have uh, reviewed the, uh, the address connected with the above noted petition that the following amounts are due to the city of Livonia. Unpaid water and sewer charges as of July 21st, 2020 uh, in the amount of $3,794.75. That letter is signed by County Compula, Chief Accountant. Next, we have a letter from the Office of the Treasurer dated uh, July 20th, 2020 that reads, in accordance with your request, the treasurer's office has reviewed the address and names connected with the above noted petition. At this time, there are no delinquent personal property taxes due. However, there are delinquent real property taxes due to the Wayne County treasurer on the above mentioned property associated with St. Jude Nursing Center, Inc. Currently operating at 34350 Ann Arbor Trail. It is my understanding that these taxes will be paid to the Wayne County treasurer through an agreement reached through the bankruptcy process with St. Jude, Jude uh, Nursing Center. I would like to have processes put in place to ensure that these, as well as the total taxes for 2019 are paid timely. Uh, new, the real property taxes for 2020 are due and the taxes for 2019 are still not paid, as well as the many years that are part of the several bankruptcy filings. Total amounts due for real property taxes is $403,598,000, um, see attached. Therefore, as of as the 2019 property taxes were not paid timely and prior to COVID, I am not in favor of extending anything. That letter is signed by Linda Shield, treasurer of the city of Livonia. Uh, lastly, I, just will, I will point out that uh, council resolution uh, 294-19 dated August 26th, uh, 2019 approving the subject development does require that all taxes due and payable regarding the subject real and personal property shall be paid in full prior to the issuance of any building or demolition permit in connection with the reference waiver use approval. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Tormina. Any questions for our planning staff? Mr. Chair? Mrs. Smiley. Yeah, am I understanding that it's like about four hundred and close to eight thousand dollars that they're due before they can even start building? That's correct. I would definitely call that significant. But I mean, if they go into bankruptcy, do they not have to pay those? 
I'm gonna I'm gonna let the uh, petitioner explain uh, what's happening. I I I can't answer that. Okay. I don't know the answer to that. Thank you. All right. We'll reserve that question for the petitioner. Thank you, Mrs. Smiley. Any other questions for our planning staff before we go to the petitioner? Chairman. Yes. Uh, following up on, on Ms. Smiley's uh, question, um, Mr. Tormina, if we extend this for the petitioner tonight and he does go into bankruptcy uh, and were to sell the property, would the approval that we would grant tonight transfer? Oh. Uh, I would have to go back and take a look at uh, the language of the um, of the resolution to see if we if there was any limitation on the transfer of the waiver to other users. Then normally it is transferable, but there are times when uh, the city council imposes a limit um, on on that transfer and requires that it go through their approval first uh, before there's a new. Uh, a new uh, operator of the waiver. So I, 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 I don't know, Mr. Venture, I apologize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Ventura. Any other questions for our planning staff? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bongero. Just a question for Mark, and I don't know if it matters, but how long have the taxes been owed to get to that amount? Uh, I can only uh, go by the treasurer's letter, and she says many years that are part of several bankruptcy filings. So I uh, let me see. The uh, actually, it would appear from the attachment uh, to her letter that it goes as far back as 2010. So they they just basically just don't pay taxes. So I mean, why do we hear cases like this? I mean, I'm not being trying to be a wise guy. I'm just saying, you know. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I mean, why do we hear cases like this? I mean, it's to further the, uh, to get the issues resolved and, and further the, uh, the, the development. This is clearly a piece of property that we want to see redeveloped. And I think if you go back and uh, I think what Mr. Molly is going to tell us is that, you know, there was an agreement in place and that they have every intention of paying these taxes. Uh, certainly uh, that can't happen. Uh, or the development can't happen until such time that that takes place. Um, what's what what the holdup has been? I, I, I quite frankly I don't know. So, okay. thanks. All right. Any other questions of our planning staff before we go to the petitioner? There's no other questions. We have Mr. Molly and uh, Mr. Van, Van Ryan here with us this evening. I'm going to allow uh, both to. Uh, unmute themselves if they wish. Uh, Mr. Molly, I believe, is going to start. Uh, good evening, sir. All right, good evening. Hi. Can uh, can everyone hear me? We hear you. Okay, great. Um, so, um, so uh, thank you for the time this evening. Um, I guess maybe before we get into the delay issues on the project, just to go back to the tax issues. Um, I, I don't know, um, or maybe as we we, we remember. We, we dealt with this extensively um, and the questions came up with bankruptcy. This property is in bankruptcy right now and, and that's um, how the taxes are being paid. So we as the petitioner are buying the property, the land, and are paying the $403,000 to the city of Livonia um, uh, as part of this development and as part of the purchase price. And so I think just, I, I, just to maybe refresh, we kind of hashed this issue out um, before a year ago when we went through the process to get the approval with the, with the commission and then again at the city council. So, so the, the, the um, former St. Jude Nursing Center um, was in bankruptcy or it is still currently in bankruptcy with an approved bankruptcy plan. The facility is now closed completely. Um, the residents are moved out of there and the agreement with, you know, as part of the bankruptcy plan and then the agreement with the city is for Livonia Healthcare Real Estate as a petitioner to pay the delinquent property taxes, the 403,000 um, in connection with this development. Um, so I guess just as a preliminary matter, because I know and I 
and I'm sorry, I think he jumped off with one of the other um, commissioners had asked the question is, you know, you know, why do we, you know, do this? And, um, and I think that was part of it was um, a part of a larger bankruptcy plan to clean up the, the taxes and then also to redevelop this property and to bring a first class, um, you know, class A product, new design model building to this particular site. So I, I would say that's where the taxes are. So that, that issue is not new um, with this extension. And, and we did um, deal with that, like I said, extensively um, last year when we got the approval. And as the other part is, you know, in the approval, there is a condition with, um, excuse me, with the, um, uh, uh, I, I, I don't know what it's called. Yeah, the, the resolution, um, you know, that specific, that specifies that no building or demolition permit can be granted until such time as the taxes are being paid. So, um, so just as a preliminary matter, as a as a secondary matter, I know that that letter that there was a, about the, the, the delinquent water, the three thousand seven hundred ninety four. Um, I, I mean, I know that you'll need confirmation, but I can confirm. I think it was a condition even putting on the agenda. So I know that that has been paid, the three thousand ninety four seventy five. We did pay that, and um, and that amount was. Um, was taken care of. Um, so I would just say, so that's just kind of the background on the taxes, the bankruptcy, and hopefully may, or maybe that answers the question of you know, what happens if it is in bankruptcy, it already is, and we're buying it out of it, out of bankruptcy. And then as, as far as the delays, um, it's it really just all based on the COVID and the pandemic. So we have been working with the development team, with the lender, um, architect, engineer. Um, I think you all have seen the civil plans um, we put a lot of work into the project and really as of about middle of February, it's been, um, you know, essentially, essentially pencils down in the skilled nursing business. So there's been really no work that's gone on, um, you, you know, certainly since the end of February, then the executive orders came in. So we've really lost three or four months and it's now just in July that we've been able to pick this project back up. Um, so we are, you know, back fully engaged. Um, I think it's just uh, sort of a circumstance of the industry and the business and because of the toll that COVID has had on, um, on skilled nursing and on nursing homes, it's just there haven't been um, resources from either the facility for the lenders, um, you know, construction architects, everything to focus on this. But, um, you know, we are back. We, um, uh, I think Jason's on the phone too. So, if, if, you know, of course he can answer any of the engineering questions. Um, but we, you know, do have a plan to continue with this development. Um, we have a lot of, um, I think, positive, uh, uh, you know, feedback. You know, po you know, positive momentum with the um, with the builders uh, and with the uh, architect and with the planners. So, you know, we are moving forward with it. We like the project, and hopefully, that answers the questions. I'd be more than happy to answer anything else. Thank you, Mr. Molly. Uh, Mr. Van Ryan, I believe, is also on. If uh, you'd like to say anything, you're welcome to. Um, yep. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Commission. Uh, thanks for uh, hearing our project tonight. I I'm, I'm here just to answer questions tonight. If there's anything specific about the site plan uh, that you have that you need a refresher on, I'm happy to go over that with you. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions for our uh, petitioners this evening? Chairman. Mr. Ventura. Uh, just a couple of questions. Um, how large is the site? Uh, Jason, Sorry. You, and, yeah, and it's, yeah, so the site area is 1.59 acres. And um, you're going to demolish the building that's there. So basically you're paying the taxes plus something else to acquire this. Is that correct? Uh, correct. Yes. And um, do the delinquent taxes appear in the title work? You don't own this property now, right? Uh, we do not own, no, we do not own this property right now. Um, the, the taxes definitely appear in the title work. They are a lien on the property, and um, and and as well the um, uh, the bankruptcy plan, um, which is also I guess encumbers the property. Um, I don't know if the right word is demands, but obligates that the taxes are being paid. 
as part okay. of the sale. You can't, you can't get clear title until you pay the taxes. Correct. And yeah, it, that's absolutely correct. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Van Ryn, and uh, thank you, Mr. Sherman. Thank you, Mr. Ventura. Uh, any other questions for our petitioners? There is no one else in the audience, so there's no one to go to there. Uh, if there is no other questions of our petitioner, then I will look for a motion. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Long. I'd like to offer an approving resolution that the request for a one-year extension of the plans approved in connection with the proposal to demolish the existing nursing home, St. Jude, and construct a new building in its place for the purpose of operating a nursing and physical rehabilitation facility in Mission Point, Livonia at 34350 Ann Arbor Trail, subject to city council approval and the following conditions. Number one, that the request for a one-year extension of the waiver use approval by Jason Van Ryn, project engineer, Niederveld uh, Incorporated, uh, on behalf of Livonia Healthcare Real Estate LLC in a letter dated July 8th, 2020, is hereby approved. Number two, that all conditions imposed by council resolution number 294-19 in connection with petition 2019050208 shall remain in effect to the extent that they are not in conflict with the foregoing condition. And number three, that all delinquent water and sewer charges and taxes due and payable regarding the subject, real and personal property shall be paid in full prior to issuance of any building or demolition permit in connection with the reference to waiver use approval. Thank you, Mr. Long. Is there support? Support. I have support by Mrs. McHugh. So we have a motion to approve an extension by Mr. Long, supported by Mrs. McHugh. Is there any discussion on the motion? If not, if the secretary is ready, please call the roll. Uh, you need to unmute. One more time. One more time, yes, Mr. Long. Aye. Mrs. McHugh. Aye. Mrs. Smiley. Aye. Mr. Bonjero. Aye. Mr. Ventura. Aye. Chairman Magno votes aye. Chairman Wolshaw. Votes aye and the motion passes. And we'll go on to city council with an approving recommendation based on the conditions that uh, you heard this evening. Thank you for coming Mr. Molly and Mr. Van Ryn for uh, attending this uh, meeting this evening. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank, Thank you. you very much. You're welcome. And uh, good night to you. And Mr. Secretary, I believe we have one more item on our agenda. You bet. Approval of the minutes of the 1,157th public hearing and regular meeting held by the Planning Commission on July 14, 2020. All right. And I believe all members were present for that meeting, according to my notes here. So is there a motion to approve? So moved. Is there support? I have a motion to uh, approve by Mr. Long, supported by Mrs. McHugh. Is there, uh, I don't think there's going to be any objection. Uh, if there is no objections to showing seven on that, I think we can do that. All right, no objections. So we'll show seven on the approval of the minutes for our previous meeting. Uh, that takes us to the end of our agenda. Is there any other business to come before the commission this evening? If not, a motion to adjourn would be in order. Mr. Chair, I move we adjourn. And do we have support? Support. support. <laughs> we have uh, plenty of support for that. Uh, it's motion to adjourn by, we'll go with Mrs. Smiley and Mr. Bongero on uh, a motion to adjourn. Again, if there is no objections, uh, I will ask that we show seven on the motion to adjourn. Done. I see no objections. So that ends our uh, meeting this evening, and I would like to thank Livonia Television staff for their contribution, bringing this meeting uh, to the public, and also, of course, to our planning department staff for being here this evening as well. Uh, with there's no further business uh, to come before the commission, we are going to end this meeting at 9:04 p.m. and wish uh, everyone in the city of Livonia a good night, and please continue to be safe and healthy. Good night. <laughs>